Hey, welcome back. It's Pastor Kevin. Welcome to First Church of God. Uh, it is a little bit chilly where I'm sitting today because I am sitting on my mom's deck. Uh, and it is uh, just after Thanksgiving. And I am looking forward to this Sunday and being in the church and sharing what Jesus has for us. Uh, you know, music is a great influencer in our lives. I, it's influenced generation after generation. Uh, don't believe me? Sometime when you're driving, look in the cars next to you and see how many people are singing along to the radio and their car. Uh, there's concerts going on as they go down the road. We have, all have our favorite style of music and often our favorite artist, if not more than one favorite artist. Uh, music asks or raises a lot of questions, but it doesn't always give us the greatest answers to those questions. Sometimes uh, there are statements in a song that uh, make us think, uh, I'm reminded of a uh, folk rock song uh, that came out during the 80s, and it makes me think of this season. Uh, the song was by a guy by the name of Tom Petty, and the song's title is The Waiting. And one of the choruses says, the waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard, you take it on faith, you take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. Yeah, the waiting is the hardest part. Uh, Christmas is coming, and, and for me, uh, Christmas is living in expectation. It is anticipating what is next. Expectation is one of the greatest things, but it can also be a really hard thing. Waiting is the hardest part. I bought one of those advent calendars that has the little windows and you open it up and there's chocolate behind it. Yeah, <laughs> the waiting is the hardest part. If, if, if my calendar is correct, Christmas is going to be on Wednesday of this week. Uh, uh, um, Chris, uh, in most uh, church calendars, we consider today the first Sunday of Advent. And what is Advent? Advent means the coming. Uh, each Sunday, many churches uh, count down Christmas to Christmas Eve by lighting a candle every week. And those candles have symbolism. They have meaning. And it helps us focus our hearts and our minds on his coming. It's a time of anticipation. Christmas has always been about hope and peace and love and joy. But keep in mind, Advent is a time of preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, but also it's got a dual meaning or a dual purpose, and that is the preparation for the return of Jesus. Now, that word Advent is not one that we find in Scripture, but it's all through the Bible uh, that we find that people are watching for the coming Messiah. Because it happened all the way back in Genesis when God uh, cursed Adam and Eve and, and the serpent, and he said that, uh, I am sending someone, and they're going to, as you strike at his heel, you're, he's going to crush your head. Uh, several times in the New Testament, after the birth of Jesus, people wondered, is this the one? Is this the one that could be the Christ? And I think Christ followers today uh, must keep both parts of Advent in mind, his birth and his return, focusing more on his return than anything else. Uh, because he, uh, he's already been born, so we can't anticipate his birth. But uh, uh, second of all, we need to remember uh, that he said... He said nothing about remembering his birth, but he said everything about remembering his death. So his death is very important. But for me, Advent is more to do with anticipation. I think the anticipation is what God has for us. And I believe he desires for us to live in constant anticipation of what he is going to do next. You see, God is consistent but he's also unpredictable. Uh, you're going to be tempted to, to peek in the next box of the Advent calendar because we can't wait to see what God is going to do next. But what do we need to do? We need to slow down a little bit. We need to measure time a little bit differently. God does not think in minutes or seconds, hours, days, months, or years. He thinks in tens of thousands of years. Uh, the idea of a day is a snap of the fingers for God. The, the idea of a month is, is a blink. Uh, we, we need to get in sync with what God uh, has and what God is doing. I'm so often reminded of Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19. It says, do not dwell in the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? So we need to get in tune with what God is doing. Uh, it, it isn't to squash our dreams. It's to reorient ourselves. And it's to know how far away we are from that thing that we've been looking for. Uh, we have to... Uh, we are called to stop living in what used to be and start finding what God is doing and where God is working right now. You see, without Christmas, 
or without Christ, we would not be having Christmas. The closest thing that we might celebrate at this time of year would be a, a winter solstice. And, and so we would not be worshiping God Almighty. We would be worshiping the, the sun, and uh, it would be a little G. And uh, we would be saving money because we wouldn't be spending it on uh, on gifts, but we would be spending it on electricity because the hours of darkness. And, and wouldn't that make it twice as dark because Jesus is the light of the world, and, and the sun won't shine as much uh, today. I want you to remember your current situation is not your permanent destination. God has something more in store for you. So say that, let me say that again, uh, or say it with me. My current situation is not my permanent destination. One of the amazing stories in the Bible uh, is found in the pages of Matthew in the second chapter. And it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah that was to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophets have written. But you, Bethlehem, him in the land of Judea are by no means the least of the rulers of Judea, for out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them exactly the time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I may too go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose Rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, uh, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by a different route. So there's some history here that I think is important for us to look at or think about. First of all, uh, Herod was crazy. Herod was not the nicest man. He liked to call himself the king of the Jews, but he couldn't do that because he was not Jewish. He was actually an Edomite. And if you go back into the Old Testament, the Edomites started with uh, 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 Jacob and Esau when Esau sold his birthright uh, to Jacob and Jacob became the chosen one, which it was very unfair. It was wrong, but it's what happened. Herod was also very insecure. Uh, remember, it just said that all of Jerusalem, Herod was disturbed and held Jerusalem with him. Uh, when he found out that Jesus was born, he made an order that any child under the age of two was to be killed. And it's very possible that when this was written, it all occurred about Jesus was about the age of two, if not just a little bit younger than that. They had moved out of the stable and into the house. Um, and so he did not want any competition. He had every child under the age of two killed. Um, if you became a threat to him, he had you killed. It's said that it was better to be one of Herod's swine than one of his children, because that's how bad he was. Uh, so in this passage, we also have a group of people called Magi. We call them wise men. They were very well educated, probably studied astronomy more than anything else. Uh, and tradition, we say that there were three, but we don't have any record of exactly how many there were. We say there were three because they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, but we don't exactly know. We know that it's a plural term, so there were more than just one. Uh, there could have been 10, could have been two, could have been 10. We don't know. It's just a tradition. But when I read this passage, I see the hope of Advent. I see the hope of his coming. And I see the dual meaning, both the return, the birth and the return of Jesus. Now these Magi, what drew, drew, drew them to Bethlehem? It wasn't just the star. They had heard the prophecies, they had read the scripture, or they studied the scripture, and they had seen the star. And that was enough to give them the hope that what they had seen, they would go and find. Uh, there are things all around us that want to steal our hope. People who want to rob our faith and steal our joy. And if we continue to listen to them, our hope starts to get strained and drained. Uh, 
I believe it's God's desire for you and me to have hope. And, and we can, uh, we can uh, base our hope on the same things that the Magi did. We have the prophecy of God's word because we have it written in front of us. And then we have the promises of God. And we, we uh, also have the activity of God in our daily lives all around us. We just need to open our eyes and see what God is doing. See, he says, I am doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? Your current situation is not your permanent destination. And so for us to experience the dual meaning of Advent, it calls us to think about hope. Hope. And I think for us to have hope, there's some things that we need to be doing. First of all, letter H, honesty. We need to live honesty. And what I mean by that is that we need to live according to what God's word says, and not what we want. And no matter how hard we desire, God's word is not going to change to make what we're doing right in his eyes. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 1, 3. It says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <laughs> Years ago, I was shopping in the, that store. Uh, I call it the Big W. I'm not going to use the name. but I, I, In fact, I was in there the other day and I had problems with one of the checkers. I got really irate with her. I got right irate with the checker. Uh, that's the last time I'm using self-check. But but years ago, I was in the Big W, and there was an announcement on the PA, and it says, we need assistance in live fish. I don't know about you, but I find that funny. I'm rolling on the floor laughing because if they assist with the live ones, do they assist with the dead ones? By the way, they do. It's called the meat department. Yeah. Um, but But living hope. Is there an opposite of living hope? The opposite of living would be dead. So I've never heard of dead hope. Now I've met people who have lost hope. And I believe what robs our hope is not just the words and the actions of those around us, but, uh, but we do it to ourselves by not living under the authority of God's word and the authority that God has placed in our lives. Let me illustrate this way. If it's raining outside, you should grab your umbrella. And if you want to stay dry, you have to open it and get under the umbrella. Just to go to the car or go into the store, wherever it is, you got to open up the umbrella and you got to stay under it. Otherwise, you're going to get all wet. There's a number of people that want the favor and the blessings of God, but they're not willing to walk in the ways of God. And they wonder why they're all, they are getting all wet. So honesty or humility. Uh, here's another word. Oh, uh, 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 for hope. And I think it's others. Jesus said, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And the great commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourselves. There are those all around us that their hope is dangling by a thread. And they've got this medical report that's not good and it's taken the wind out of their sail. For you and me, we, we don't know the words to tell them, but what we can do is take their hand and cry with them as followers of Jesus. Because it's this follower of Jesus by the name of Paul who said, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. What about the letter P of hope? Could it be presence? Uh, for us, to have hope, I think we need to walk daily, hourly in the presence of God, recognizing that he is an ever-present help in time of troubles. If I, if I were to choose a second P, it might be present. Practice the present presence of God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. What are you hoping for? I've got a lot of stuff I'm hoping for. Uh, I, I think my mother is hoping to see signs of me growing up someday. We, we talk about sharing our faith, but what about sharing our hope? Sharing our faith is uh, looking backwards, but while sharing our hope is looking forward. Everyone has hope. And it all boils down to the foundation of your hope. Uh, uh, of how you make it through the storm. As Christ followers, our foundation is solid. Uh, most of the graves in the catacombs were marked with one of three Christian symbols. It was either a, a descending dove representing the Holy Spirit or a cross or an anchor. In Hebrews uh, 6.19, we read, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Anchors keep things in place, and our hope anchor is firm and secure. Our hope is an optimistic outlook based on powerful promises of God's word. 
Worldly hope doesn't have a foundation of promises. The Bible says that all of God's promises are yes and amen. Now, the letter E of hope, what if it was for engage? Uh, you, we have to engage our hope by activating it, activating your hope and faith. See, I believe that hope and faith are very closely related, and you can't have one without the other. And faith is like a muscle. It has to be exercised or it's going to fade away. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. When Jesus was with his disciples, they asked him, hey, Jesus, increase our faith. And they'd seen all these miracles, Jesus healing the lame and the blind and raising the dead to life. And they thought, oh, all he has to do is speak the word and we'll have more faith. And, and Jesus knew that faith doesn't work that way. It's something that we have to grow within us. So he, he and, and one of the things that the word of God says in Romans 10, 17, it says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's through an individual's own quest to know God that our faith is increased. Faith is increased by hearing the word of God and then not just hearing it, but doing what it says. Uh, faith and hope are also increased as we step out in faith. And we step out in faith as we love those that are less than easy to love. And if we're going to have this dual advent, looking at the birth and at the return, uh, we can't sit still. We've got to be honest, honest to God's word and the direction the Holy Spirit gives us. And if the Holy Spirit says that's sin, that's wrong, then we need to obey and walk away from that particular sin. We need to focus on others, uh, that they too may know Christ. Uh, last week, I challenged the church to be praying for two people that don't know Jesus Christ. And it's not a one and done. It's something that you pray on a regular basis that these people will come to know Jesus Christ. And when they do, you celebrate and then you put somebody else on the list and you keep praying that they would come to know Christ. The P, remember, practice present presence. Practice the presence of God. Recognize that he is with you everywhere that you go. Stop looking at what has happened in the past and start looking at what God is doing right now and start searching what God wants you to be doing in your life. Do not dwell on the past. Start looking for the new things that God is doing right where you are. And finally, engage. Activate your faith by stepping out of your comfort zone and into what God has prepared for you to do, something God prepared for you to do way in advance. God has promised that if we seek him, we will find him. If we will seek Seek him with all of our heart. Um, we've got to move beyond storing up some of that hate that we have for some other people, some of the lust and disobedience. And we need to start worshiping Christ during this Advent season and seeking what he is doing right now and what part he wants us to have in that. This is Pastor Kevin. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.